recording has started. Thank you. Uh, so this is the W3C Weber to see working group meeting, December 5th, 2023. We abide by the W3C working group IPR policy, which is described in the patent policy link below and only people and companies listed at the link on the slide are allowed to make substantive contributions. So we will be having two working group meetings this month, today, and then next week at, at the same time. Uh, we will uh, cover a lot of stuff. We'll go over everything right now. Uh, and then we'll have a meeting next week. We'll, we'll try to finish off everything for the year, and then we'll start back up in, in January and have meetings after that. So the links to the slides are up on the wiki. We do, uh, meetings being recorded. We do need to have volunteers for note taking. We have that? I'll do it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Don. And there's the IRC uh, for the link for the scribe. All right, we have a W3C code of conduct, which we operate under and Please keep things cordial and professional. I think you've all figured out how to use Google Meet, but we do use the hand raising tool to manage the speaker queue. So please uh, raise and lower your hand appropriately and use microphones, et cetera. Please do not jump the speaker queue or we'll mute you. Okay. Uh, I don't think I have to repeat this, but basically just because something's in the repo doesn't mean it's not working group consensus. Okay, so here's uh, the agenda for today, and uh, we'll also have an agenda for next week, but we're gonna finish off the grab bag slides that we didn't get to last time, and then uh, an extended use case discussion we also didn't get to last time. We'll give an hour to RTP Transport uh, to talk about that, and then uh, do the wrap up. All right, so off to the grab bag. And um, so we have, Three specs we're going to talk about with some issues for each, and we'll start off with FIPO uh, PR212. Okay, FIPO, you have the floor. Uh, I don't hear you. Hopefully, you're not muted. Uh, Fibbo? I've seen him mute and unmute, so he's troubleshooting some issues on his side, I guess. Yes, is that better? Yes, we yes. can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. So this PR is describing the data attribute in encoder transform, which is the core of the specification basically and it's codex specific with several surprises and now that we have mind type we can actually describe it in codex specific terms so the epr adds a table with informative references for a few mind types it also describes svc behavior which might lead to issues if you do your end-to-end -end encryption key derivation function wrong it currently does not describe simulcast because that's Pretty trivial, I would say. It also describes some issues that you need to take care of if you are interested in letting the underlying packetizer packetize the packets as intended. For example, H.264 needs a series of null units with start codes. And it also mentions some issues we have with AV1, where you can have a input that is different from the output. So all things that we need to take care of as developers. The ask is to review that and then merge if there are no objections. 
Any questions? If there are no questions, we can probably move it to the editor's meeting. Oh, Yanni, go. You're on mute, Yanni. Yes, I was just going to make that suggestion that uh, we we should get uh, doing PR reviews in meetings uh, is probably not um, the best use of our time. But uh, thank you for this PR. It's very uh, it's looking good to me as far as I can tell. So just to clarify, it does not add any API surface, right? It's merely describing the existing data member. Yes. Yeah. On the surface, I don't see a problem with that. Mm -hmm. so thank you. Okay, then we can have the editors uh, integrate, right? Well, I think we need to. It needs to follow the regular review process, uh, which uh, then hopefully will lead to uh, merging. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then we can move to the next topic. Uh, Harold is on the queue. Yeah, just just uh, we're ad we're adding new kinds of information, so I think it's perfectly appropriate to to use the use the tool for use the meet meeting for ensuring that everyone's okay with with ha having this information. As it's clearly marked informational, I think we're not trying to override anything. So I think this is good, but it's it's good. It's worth worth meeting time to say yes. It's good. Bernard? Yeah, I think this is information that's not that people need to know. It doesn't seem to be present anywhere else. So I think it's pretty valuable to have it out there. Uh, but it, it it shouldn't be normative. Um, but but it definitely should be should be in there somewhere. Maybe I can ask a question. Uh, was there anything when you wrote this together that stood out as problematic or, or unusual? Any codex or, uh, well, in particular, I guess, uh, what about the, does, did it reveal any concerns with uh, packetization of certain codecs, for example? I think the two bytes are gone from AV1 oh. was was a surprise, but okay, yeah. All right, thanks. I can't hear Fippo, so I don't know if he's talking, but I guess we can move on. Okay, Samir. Yes, hi. Thanks. So I wanted to talk about uh, PR 175, which is to add uh, method remove candidate pair to RDCI's transport. So this was discussed originally at uh, TPAC, but there's some open questions on the PR that I would like to get a resolution to. So the first question is, what is the use case for this new method? So the idea is that uh, with the APIs that we've already uh, added to the spec, an app can nominate, uh, can cancel uh, the nomination of a candidate pair that the ICE agent has picked and it can instead switch to a different candidate pair. Uh, and now the app wants to free up the resources that are tied up in candidate pairs that it uh, no longer has any use for. And so the app should be able to remove those candidate pairs with this new method. The second question is, what exactly does it mean to remove? Uh, so uh, the app wants to tell the ICE agent that it does not want to use this candidate pair in this ICE session. That's the intention of remove. Uh, but the feedback was that we should uh, make this clearer in terms of uh, uh, operations that are actually uh, specified in RFC 8445 in, uh, in the interest of uh, interoperability. 
And so my proposal is to define it in terms of these specific operations. So first, the ICE agent removes the pair from any checklists uh, that contain the, that pair. And uh, the effect that that would have is that no more ICE connectivity checks would be sent on that candidate pair. The second is that the ICE agent updates the states of any checklists that are affected by the first uh, operation. And uh, the result of that would be if, uh, if a checklist ends up with only failed candidate pairs, then uh, that entire checklist state would, uh, would be failed. And that may lead to uh, the state of ICE being failed as well. Uh, down the line. And then the third action is to free up any uh, candidates that are no longer paired with a remote candidate. So that's, again, a specific operation in the RFC. And uh, the effect of that would be to release, release any resources that are tied up in these candidates. Uh, and uh, there's also another clarification that candidate pairs removed in this way cannot be added back uh, in the same session. You would need an ICE restart for that. Uh, that is, of course, until uh, we get to regathering at some point on the line, in which case uh, this could change. Then the th third question was, uh, it was an array argument needed, uh, which was in the original proposal for this API. It's not strictly needed. I've changed that to reflect uh, a single candidate pair right now. But uh, the goal of having an array was to optimize the operation. So, uh, Again, with the use case, the idea is that uh, there may be, the app might want to remove several candidate pairs together uh, once it's done picking the one that it actually wants. And so it would be useful to have an array. Uh, and again, the operations that I've described uh, that remove entails, uh, those can lead to several state transitions. So it might be useful to uh, batch that together into for several candidate pairs at the same time. So uh, that's uh, the, yeah, uh, we can move on to questions. So I think Peter was first. I think this looks good. I just had two minor things. Uh, one about the array argument for removing. On one hand, it makes sense if you have like 90 candidate pairs you want to remove. Um, but on the other hand, it does complicate the return promise because then you have to figure out what that means. Like if some candidate pairs error and removal because they didn't make sense, but others don't. So it'd be a little tricky to figure out. <clears throat> um, my bigger question was around the removing pairs not being allowed to be added back. I can understand that to be the case if adding or removing a candidate pair causes a local candidate to be freed because it's not being used anymore. But if it's not, and I and it's um, removing a candidate pair and then immediately adding it back and no other state changed. Um, I don't see why you couldn't. Is that just a simplification so that we don't have to think about that? Or is there some reason why that can't happen? So, so we don't have an API to add a candidate pair to it, right? So what you could do is add remote candidate and then that could end up pairing that remote candidate with a local candidate and recreating that same candidate pair essentially. Oh, okay. So you're talking about the the browser won't add it back, right? But the we and we don't have a mechanism yet for the web app to add one. So in the future, if we add a mechanism for the mm -hmm. web app to add one, that be, might be a different rule. But this is about the browser not adding it back. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. That clarifies. Yeah. Uh, and then the array again. Uh, yeah, to your point, there may be a lot of candidate pairs, and we have actually seen devices that uh, just create a ton of candidate pairs because they have several network interfaces, whether virtual or real. And so that was the intention behind having an ARI argument in the first place. Uh, okay. I'm not sure who's next in queue. Is it Bernard or Yanivar? I think I am. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask you what you meant by canceling nomination. Did you mean you nominated and somehow wanted to unnominate, or you wanted to remove a, remove pairs before nomination? I just yeah. Uh, so by cancel, uh, what I mean is we have an event uh, that we've added to the spec, which is ICE candidate pair nominate. And what that is, is when the ICE agent has selected a candidate pair that it wants to 
uh, nominate it uh, for that event. If the app cancels it, then the nomination does not go through, and okay. uh, the app can continue to change candidate pairs using select candidate pairs. Okay. So yeah. basically, you you see something being nominated that you don't necessarily want. You you remove that pair so that uh, potentially something else could get nominated. Okay. That that makes more sense to me. Thank yeah. you. you. You can cancel the nomination. You don't necessarily need to remove it uh, right away, but yeah, you could do that as well. Uh, Yanni Bar? I think Henrik is on first. Oh, Hi, sorry. Yeah. Uh, just a comment. If if performance ever becomes a concern, it's, uh, it's possible to uh, delay the, like you can do a bulk post task of all the pairs that you've removed in the task execution cycle like just delay it until the end that that achieves that allows you to do the same performance optimization if you want to it might be bulkier to implement but i just wanted to comment that out that performance wise you, you can you can in, internally implement it as an array right yeah cool so but that's pr uh, looks good to me uh, okay. regardless uh, so uh, just to be clear, so you are in favor of having a single argument and then the optimization can go under the cover. It doesn't have to be part of the API itself. I, I personally don't care one way or the other. I think whether it's an array or not an array, I'm happy either way. Uh, just pointing out that either way can be optimized. Right. Yeah, great. Thanks. So so I would say I, I don't like the array. I don't think it's necessary. Uh, and I think you can express JavaScript can just call the multi method multiple times and get individual promises. And you could use promise all and get the same behavior and same performance, pretty much. Uh, which I think is what Henrik said as well, as far as it was possible to optimize that if that wasn't the case. Um, you mentioned ICE agent, ICE gathering sessions. So I want to make clear that so if the application removes these and you then do a restart ICE, uh, that's a new game, right? Then they can come yes. back. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so my last comment then is that overall, I feel like what we're accomplishing here is sort of a bit of a hack to get around nomination, because uh, we perhaps feel nomination was too strict, and uh, and I think I might be fine with that. I just want to make clear that um, we only, if the PR could clarify that we're only modifying behavior that is user agent behavior. I know we did that when we added a select candidate pair, for example. We could find references in the ITF specs that set. This was up to the user agent. So just want to make sure that's the case here as well. Uh, so I'm not completely sure I understand what you mean by hack to get mm -hmm. around nomination. Like, uh, as I mentioned, you don't need to remove, uh, the app doesn't need to remove the pair that got nominated. It can just cancel the nomination and prevent the nomination from happening. So remove isn't right. necessary mm -hmm. to, pre to prevent nomination. Sure. Uh, I guess uh, I'm, I'm OK with that. Um, but it seems like the goal here is to give JavaScript more control. I just want to make sure that we're not overstepping anything in the ITF spec, and this, that we're just modifying user agent behavior. Is that still the case? Uh, so, uh, can, I, can I chime in? Yep, please. Uh, an implementation device is always free to remove candidate pairs. Great, thanks. And this, this looks uh, good to me. Nice and simple. So uh, I'll just update the PR with uh, the resolution to these items, and then hopefully that can uh, continue the review and uh, get merged. Thanks. So who has oh, the next slide? Yeah. That is me. Oh. Um, so uh, today I wanted to talk about uh, data channels and uh, binary type um, property on a data channel, which um, you can use to um, change a different type of uh, values you get uh, when you receive data. So that data can be of two types in the spec. It can be either a blob or an array buffer. Um, in the specification at the moment, blob is a default value. Um, but some um, user agent has only implemented array buffer. Uh, and for the sake of compatibility, a lot of um, 
with sake of compatibility with Chrome, not with the specification, a lot of the applications on the web have only supported uh, using uh, array buffers, and some of them don't even specifying uh, which type of uh, data they want to receive. So they expect the default to be array buffer as in Chrome. And this has caused some uh, compatibility issues on the web. Now we are at a point where uh, this implementation has shipped for so long that trying to fix it in Chrome will probably break a lot of applications that are expecting the default to be uh, array buffer and not blob. So um, I tried to go back uh, in time to see why this happened. And this seems to be uh, to try to get compatibility between the API of uh, data channels and web sockets. At this point, uh, data channels have diverged uh, quite significantly from WebSocket. I'm not sure if that's something that is as important to maintain. And uh, with all the transports that are um, uh, being shipped on the web, like web transport, it's probably okay to accept that we have divergence um, on the APIs. So I'm proposing that uh, to fix uh, compatibility issues, since there are probably more applications that are trying to be, very few applications that are trying to be compliant and request blob, because they would only be able to target um, either Safari or Firefox. And most of them are probably better to use array buffers, which is a more modern API at the moment. We had some plans on using uh, array blobs to be able to send big files with data channels, but this is not something that is possible even if it was implemented because uh, messages are capped to a specific size. So we don't we don't benefit a lot from blobs. And I think, yeah, we should probably have default to be array buffer. Um, so we have uh, Randall on the queue. Yes. So having been the person who originally designed this, um, uh, the short answer uh, is that at this point, it probably makes sense to switch to default because uh, the lack of implementation has won over the spec, um, unfortunately. Um, the, uh, it is possible to send large files if you have blob support, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, feet were drug long enough that it has that we has forced our hand. So uh, I agree with you on the we should change the default. I disagree that we can change large files because the API uh, does not allow that because all messages that you do with send needs to be uh, within the max message size limits. And we are if you try to if you didn't have a max message size and you try to send, I don't know, a four gigabyte file, that would mean that you would receive only a one on message event on the other side after exchanging four gigabytes and just one message. We do not allow um, chunked receiving at all. So this is not the practical API for exchanging large files. So yeah, we, if we want to do that, there, uh, we could reuse yeah. blobs in different ways, but at the moment, this is not the API to do that. I mean, you can polyfill around it by just and do your do it on yourself uh, on top of data channels. But like I said, yes, of course, feet have been drugged long enough. It is water under the bridge now, unfortunately. So I mean, it just does if if they future if they future a warning that when we write a spec, everyone should be if especially when people agree to a spec people should try to implement it and not just leave it hanging in a in a, in a uh, non-compatible state for years. Yeah, it's something that is possible to ship in Chrome, 
the problem is changing the default value uh, right. in Chrome from I prefer right. to blob. That's something that is breaking uh, yeah. potentially a lot of applications. Yeah. That's a problem and why I, I haven't done that. Um, yeah. We have Bernard next on the queue. Yeah, is that a typo on the slide where you say Safari correctly is Bob? Did you mean Firefox? Yeah, you have yes. both WebKit and Safari there. Yes, sorry. That makes sorry. more sense. I fixed the slide now. If you reload, it will be fixed for everyone, but uh, it probably doesn't matter at this point. Uh, yes, it's uh, Firefox um, ships um, Blob uh, by default, and uh, Chromium and WebKit use array buffer by default, but only WebKit supports uh, both. And Chrome does not have support for Blobs at the moment. I believe Firefox supports both. And yes, we do. of course. Yeah. Of course, otherwise it would be impossible to write anything with data channels on the web in a good way for application developers. All right, so I hear a decision that we will uh, change the default and um, submit this soon. Thank you. All right, my turn. Audio track stats. <clears throat> so uh, we've talked in the past uh, several times about adding uh, latency. So this is not about adding latency because we we've uh, recently added it uh, to the spec. Uh, the the input latency is the uh, measurement between the of, of the input device and the to the delivery uh, uh, to any of its things for. So to the web app, for example. Uh, and we have this as an instantaneous value. But so what we want to have is an average latency. Uh, and in the past, I believe we talked about copying the old RBRTC get stats behavior. Uh, because uh, so apps would want to know the average over app defined interval, which could change over time. So it needs to be able to decide. And, and what we do in the old uh, Robert C gets that we usually uh, had a, a sum counter and then a number of measurements counter. And then you would divide the two. So delta measurement divided by delta number of measurements. But it's been rightly pointed out that this is not very ergonomic, first of all. So why copy, copy that into this new API? And more importantly, why we don't uh, we can't use this is uh, that if you only have the average, you're hiding peaks and frauds. Uh, so uh, apps would want to know the min and max as well. Next slide. The question is, how do we expose this? And can I have the next? There we go. Um, so the proposal is to to let the, the user agent calculate average, minimum, and maximum uh, for you for ergonomic reasons. And in order to support apps being able to look at these values during uh, different time intervals, uh, there's a reset latency method. So these would be average, min, and max since last time you called the reset latency. Keep it simple. Proposal, merge PR. Any objections, thoughts, opinions? Well, just checking is is there a way to figure out when the when reset left latency was called? Well, the the app would know. So I would it depend, argue. depend on the app on the app's app's memory for that. Yes, I mean, we so could add a timestamp, uh, but yeah. So okay. reset is synchronous. Yes. Okay. I think makes sense since the rest of the API is synchronous. Okay, is everyone happy? Yeah, no objection uh, on my end. Perfect. Go in once, go in twice. Boom. Okay, next slide. I'm done. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to extended use cases. And this is a continuation of the discussion at uh, TPAC, I believe. All right, so uh, first bring you up to date on where we were, summarize everything. Uh, so this is a discussion of the low latency streaming use cases. Um, there's 3.2.1 is game streaming and the other is low latency broadcast with fan out. We had a CFC on January 16th. Um, and almost all the issues referred to in that CFC have been closed. Um, there's just uh, one remaining, which is issue 103, which we're going to attempt to close today. Um, we decided that issue 80, which was about raw audio data, would move to another use case. Um, so we're on the verge, as you saw, we, we had consensus for it, but just trying to fix a few issues for these two use cases. Okay, so back to this. This is the uh, section 3.2.2, the way the low latency broadcast would fan out exists at the moment. Um, we've been discussing, so at the moment, it includes a lot of different use cases, including town hall meetings, um, church services, webinars, and sporting events. The problem we've had is these uh, use cases have very different requirements. Um, some of them don't need low latency, like the church service probably doesn't need low latency. The town hall meeting, uh, only latency is only relevant when somebody asks a question, whereas some of the others do require very low latency, like sporting events. So the problem with mixing all of these things together is that they don't necessarily come up with, uh, it makes it harder to come up with requirements. And originally as formulated uh, when Tim Panton uh, put this in, it was all about purely very low latency things um, like auctions. So uh, we have a PR-123, which is basically attempting to get back to the original purpose of this use case as suggested by Tim, which is these very low latency things, auctions. Um, and uh, there is a need potentially for participant feedback there at low latency because people are bidding. Um, in this use case, DRM is not required, whereas some in some of the other ones, like the sporting events, they would be. So we're trying to focus it on stuff that is the kind of thing in particular that the ITF has been focusing on in their WISH working group, which is WebRTC-based gestion, um, which is WIP, and then distribution, which is which is WEP. Um, and so we're proposing to take out the um, use cases which don't require the ultra low latency, like the church services and webinars. Um, many of those don't use WebRTC at the moment. They use stuff like low latency HLS instead. Uh, and the fan out requirements for those are already covered by the RTC data channel um, things in section 3.1 uh, file sharing. Stuff like RTC data channel and workers and things like that are already in there. So in some sense, uh, those use cases, by the way, are already operating other in wide use and they, they, um, they are making use of some of the new stuff like the RTC data channel and workers, but otherwise um, there's no unique requirements there. So um, then the question is for the fan out for auctions, uh, why is data channel not a good fit? What, what are the issues there? And the problems are that this is an ultra low latency application. And so you have issues with the congestion control uh, of SCTP, um, potential issues with back pressure, uh, which are well known due to the decoupling and the event loop in the receive window. Um, and then you have the RTCP, you need to do RTCP style feedback on top of the data channel, like a P send a PLI in feck and red, and at which point you're asking yourself, hey, why don't I just use RTP? Um, so anyway, so this is the uh, proposed new version of this with PR-123 applied. Um, and it basically talks about the, um, still has requirements N15 and N39, but um, re reconceives the description of the use case, calls it ultra low latency broadcast with fan out, um, and talks about uh, the needs, which include uh, being potentially behind a NAT, so peer to peer is important for peer to peer relays. Um, and then uh, the uh, transport requirements. Um, typically, for the ultra low latency, you have to have unreliable and unordered um, and uh, do. Uh, 
your own retransmission in, in FEC. Um, so this responds to a previous description, which tried to make it less uh, dependent on a particular solution like RDP, although that's uh, that's what's been used in things like pipe and build. Okay, so who is in the queue? It's me. Oh, okay. Hi, Anna. Uh, hi. Uh, yes. Um, maybe we can remove millions. I mean, that would be great if we reach that goal, but it seems quite ambitious to put into. Like, I worry we have a use case, and if we can't satisfy it, then we're stuck. And no, millions for an auction might be a little bit much. Yeah. So, yeah, the, it's typically the webinars that get into that that kind of numbers, but they're not as they're not the actual it's the interactive kids. So, yeah, that probably makes sense to remove the millions. Can you, by the way, uh, put in put that into the discussion of PR one twenty three, so I can remember it, and also put it in the notes. Who else is in the queue? Anyone else? All right. So it sounds like people seem like they're okay with this reformulation of uh, case. All right. So moving on to the um, oh, did hi. not mean to raise hand meant to do a thumbs up uh, I, okay henrik go ahead go back uh, so I, you... I'm, I'm happy i didn't mean to raise the hand sorry oh, okay sorry all right all right so let's go on to the game streaming um this is the way that use case looks currently uh, and again, it's it's focused on game sharing using leverage C, which is actually pretty pretty popular now with NVIDIA and xCloud and all that stuff uh, out there. Um, and but we're trying to, uh, in particular, discuss some uh, as the resolutions get bigger and so forth. Performance has become a very big issue, particularly moving towards 4K. So we're trying to get a handle on what exactly the requirements are for for performance. So that's some of the issues that we've got outstanding on that. Um, and so to that extent, uh, what we have here is an, still some comments on issue 103. Uh, and then we have two PRs, uh, actually maybe more, 125 and 118, relating to trying to clarify some of the performance requirements for gaming. All right. So here's issue 103, which was feedback from UN. Um, and uh, so uh, one question was N37, which is a performance requirement. Uh, is it is it purely about implementation? Um, and you know, uh, I think the answer to that is no. But exactly what we're talking about needs to be clarified. And then, uh, um, yeah, I think the other ones. The main the main point here was about N37, is uh, formulating in a way that it makes clear what the API requirement is, not just uh, throwing more resources at it. Uh, and we did clarify the term low latency uh, with respect to the other uh, fan out use case. All right, so what we're attempting to do here is clarify this performance requirement. And you know what it originally said is must be possible for the receive pipeline to process video at high resolution and frame rate. And I think UN pointed out correctly that, hey, you know, what has this got to do with the API? And so but the thing that I think does have to do with the API is control of hardware acceleration. Um, that that's where that that becomes important. So that we added that as a clarification, um, and that would potentially bring in things like uh, we have this open issue I think that Fippo has been talking about, which is events for hardware failover, things like that, um, or other things that could control the use of hardware acceleration would would fit in there. So. Ah, Randall. From the point of view of the spec, what does the word controlling here mean? Exactly. Well, it could mean it, the kind of things that have been suggested are, are the following. One is the ability. Uh, uh, we we have talked about this, although we haven't figured out how to do it, which is to 
be able to control whether you specifically want hardware. Uh, if you have a, if you, in Web Codex, for example, we have a prefer hardware where you get to um, say that you specifically want hardware acceleration or not or bust. Um, we've talked about that in Web to see, haven't really formulated a way to do it. Uh, although we do have something in Web to see extensions to basically turn off all hardware acceleration, which is more for, for bugs than uh, for other stuff. Henrik has uh, filed an issue on events where you would get an event where you failed over from hardware to software. This turns out to be important to gamers because when you fail over, the whole thing could just experience could go to, go to heck. Um, you know, if you're doing 4K and you need the hardware accelerate, hardware accelerated gig code and you don't have it. it is so not notification about whether or not hardware acceleration is being in use certainly seems a, a useful thing to have. However, that doesn't seem to apply to this. I mean, the I mean, I don't understand what sort of requirement is this adding on the, an implementation other than like you should make an implementation that's good. It well, does, it, no, no, it, it does because um, if having that information that you know Henrik filed in the issue would let you know, for example, why hardware acceleration failed and what you can do oh, about it. Having having notification about whether you have hardware acceleration or not, that seems reasonable. This part, but here we're talking about the requirements on implementation, not on notification. Uh, no, it was it was it's not an implementation requirement. It's an API requirement. That's the only reason we do these these things. Yeah, the problem is that people have complained that they don't know why it's switching over, and also. Uh, because they don't know why, they don't know how to get it back. For example, if you were to know that you failed over from hardware to software because of resources, you could notify the user that there's something interfering with their game. Whereas if it's a data, if, it, if the decoder barfed on data, you would know you, that's not something you can fix. So that that actually, that that information gives you the ability to control whether you're getting hardware. Uh, okay, understood, uh, understood, and that seems reasonable. I'm just saying, I don't see the connection between that and this wording. This wording, I think, needs to be changed to make it clearer what you're actually requiring yeah. it from the API. Yeah, we're basically, I think what we're trying to do in, Henrik has his hand raised, so he can talk about it more. What, what? No, so I'm, I'm, my question or my input is might be a response to Randall, if I might chime in. So why? Because I, I think controlling is a, a good word to use here, because this isn't about just preferring hardware or software for uh, any given codec. Uh, like as in the user agent decides and then I get input or uh, I get a, a callback saying whether or not I got it. Like there is an element of control in the sense that different codecs and different scalability modes will have different hardware support. And because the application needs to negotiate and decide what to use, there is an element of, of the app needs to know what what's possible and then it needs to make a decision based on the available hardware support right so i just so wanted sounds, to add that right so it sounds like what we're talking about is exposing more information about uh um, current um, hardware support for streams that are running and more information about potential hardware support for streams that are being offered yes yeah, so, so also like what can you do if you don't get, uh, if it, it does fall back, what can you do about it? Or even before you set up the call, what which right. set should you use? Uh, right. So, and, so and to that extent, I think controlling is, a, is an appropriate word to use. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, yet another thing which Vipo can probably talk about for hours is the whole actual situation currently with respect to codecs that can only send or receive, and what a big mess we have. But um, we'll leave that to later. <laughs> Harold, I think. Yeah, so uh, the point of uh, controlling here is that it's a keyword for asking, can can you do this? Uh, and saying, I want you to do this, and getting the message back saying, no, I wasn't able to do it. So uh, uh, we, we can't put all that in into the requirements. So I think right. controlling is a, as good as wor a word as any. And 
I think we should remember that that's what we're using using the word for. Uh, Jan Ivar. So, uh, yes, yeah, so being able to control hardware definitely might be required in order to meet this use case already. That's why I feel it's a bit redundant to call it out uh, because that might not be true tomorrow. I mean, uh, we so when we, the assumption for these use cases, they have high performance requirements already. So if they, you know, but I don't think we should preclude reaching those require, requirements uh, without hardware. I mean, uh, and we should be confident, I think, that that's not possible today. Then, you know, I don't think we need additional language. It, it, it doesn't seem like an a, a independent requirement, if you will. So I think it's already met by by the, the what we're trying to accomplish here in the first place. So maybe there's a way to to specify the performance requirement so that it is clear that it would need hardware today. It, it does say, I, I, on in support of this, I would say it does say, e.g. by controlling hardware, it does not require, say that hardware hardware's acceleration is required. It says that that's a way to a way to to meet the requirement for high resolution frame rate. Right, but usually when we spell out examples in these specs, when there's no other uh, descriptive text, I think it, it's pretty specific. But yeah, I, I think uh, the the concerns we might run into is privacy and tag review and those kind of things. So. Uh, we we'll probably run into them anyway, but uh, it's uh, if we could reword it slightly, uh, it, I, I think I would be in favor of that. Okay, well, feel free to make comments to about the wording or how to make it more clear. Right. Uh, is there anyone else left in the queue? If not, okay. Um, so the sense I get is people are generally favorable towards this, but potentially some maybe finding a better word than controlling, although some people think that's okay. Um, how uh, about adding how about adding if necessary? Okay, that's fine. Controlling hardware if necessary, acceleration if necessary. That's good to me. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. All right, so what remaining do we have to do? Okay, so then uh, I'm going to turn this over to Sun, which is PR 118, um, which relates to some other uh, game streaming requirements uh, relating to this performance. Um, go ahead, Sun. Yeah, uh, hi. <clears throat> this is about the game streaming requirement. Um, can you go to the next slide? Yes, so we um, propose two different uh, category of uh, requirement in one PR. Uh, first one is fast recovery, which is N48 and 49. And next slide. For the consistent latency, we propose N50 and 51. So actually, this has four different uh, sub requirement in uh, one PR. So can you go next slide? I will explain one by one. So we've been discussed about this uh, requirement uh, in at last uh, TPAC meeting. So we know there is a, uh, some way to implement. Uh, we know that there should be very detailed uh, implementation need to be discussed later, but we just wondering whether we can put this requirement into the game streaming as uh, as it is because there should be lots of uh, details but uh, we just wondering whether this requirement is meaningful to be presented as a requirement uh, linda yeah unmuting there we go so uh uh i would I would definitely support this. I mean, when we first designed WebRTC, we we purposely did not specify what happens 
in terms of the decoding on a um, on a frame loss, and you know you you are allowed to continue to decode um, if you if you wish. Right now, the current um, uh, WebRTC lib uh, uh, implementation does not do so. However, um, there's no reason it couldn't. I've certainly worked with um, setups in the past on video phones where on a uh, on a loss we would continue decoding with errors okay until we until a uh, correction frame iframe or whatever could could be received and of course um, uh, support for um, non full iframe uh, 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 corrections uh, certainly is possible as well um, uh, by using various other mechanisms to uh, 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 ship an up uh, ship an update that uses a previous decoded uh, 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 de per previously decoded correct frame as a source uh, with a new p frame. So uh, so yes, I would absolutely su support this as as a uh, uh, for this. Thank you, uh, Bonar. Yeah, I guess my question is, is there any API changes necessary to support this? I mean, you, you, do, you are talking about the encoder and decoder API, but those that's C, C++ stuff, so it doesn't surface to JavaScript. Um, you know, if this were web codex, I would say, yes, there is. there are API changes necessary to do this because the web codex API doesn't do it. But it's not clear to me that's true of WebRTC. Do you think there's something in WebRTC API that would actually need to change? Uh so based on uh, my understanding, the application need to set the uh, flag, whether the application want to use non frame recovery or not. That is the minimum uh, uh, changes on the API side. Yeah, and I would say, yeah, we, we would need an API change that lets an application request this, um, uh, 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 Let's the application request this uh, behavior, um, and because you can't it's just, it's assume an it'll occur. It's just not just not just an STP parameter. It's okay. Peter. Uh, so I think supporting this would require a fairly large change to LibWebRTC's video jitter buffer, and I'm just wondering if that, if that is even in the ballpark of possibly happening. Because if it doesn't, then no browser is going to ship this. I guess that's just what I'm wondering if this is a realistic thing to see happen. On the other hand, one of the use cases for RTP transport is custom jitter buffer. And if we had that, then a web app could do their own jitter buffer. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yaniba? Uh, yes, so I, I would also question whether there's any need for the W3C to look at this because it sounds to me like this could be negotiated in SDP um, and that user agents that wanted to explore this could do that. Uh, it doesn't, I'm not sure it needs to have necessarily an API surface, but open to here otherwise. Yeah, that, we was, should I, clarify that's that's that my, initially. Yeah, that was my question, Jan Ebert. Right. Yeah, I agree with Bernard. Yeah. And so, so um, yeah, I mean, you don't have to have an API service. You could insert stuff in the SDP to try to try to indicate this. Uh, I I consider that a little bit of a hack, um, uh, but it, it it could be done. Um, as for the implementation, having done this in the past, I mean, yes, it would require changes in the jitter buffer and so forth, um, but. Fundamentally, I don't think it, it would be, you know, a major rewrite type of effort. I think it would be relatively, rel you know, small to medium amount of work to let it de continue to de de decode while it's waiting for a, for a uh, iframe. You you of course have you'll of course will have some errors in the buffers. Um, Uh, so uh, 
considering the question of whether we could do this by merging SDP, when the, if I were on the other side uh, saying I, I might here if I control SDP, I would say, does it change the bits on the wire? And if the answer is no, then uh, no, it's got no business being SDP. So if there's going to be any control at all, besides the fact that SDP merging is bad for you, and uh, it has to be in the API. So yes, it, yes, it requires API. If it's if it's not on all the time, then it requires API. End of story. The, the necessary API might actually be be RTP transport. What do I know? But uh, it does require API. Uh, one of times that if this is not on all the time, uh, then it does need an API. Uh, whether it's reusing something that already exists or, or, or something new. Uh, but my question regarding this not always being on all the time, um, if this was possible to do, would there be any reason to turn it? Would there be any reason to not have this on all the time? Like, does this add overhead that you don't want to use in a, uh, some use cases? Is there a need for a control knob, or can the browser decide? Is my, what I'm wondering because I don't know what is this an encoder side change, a decoder side change, or both. You know? Yeah, I think there probably be applications that wouldn't want this. Um, like, a, for example, if you're doing something for a legal case, I don't think you might want to only make sure that every frame that was put through was you know, in a defined decoder state or something. I think you do have to control whether it's on or off. So they could be like artifacts vis visible. Right, right. Weird living frames, okay. Yeah, then we need an API. Yeah, Sorry, but before we conclude, we need an API. We need, we need uh, formal use case that says that indeed we need uh, off switch because we have the use case for the on, <laughs> but it's not clear we have the use case for the off. Okay, so I think uh, we discussed this uh, good enough. And I I hope we get some feedback through the GitHub uh, discussion so we can follow up. Uh, the next one, uh, I have three more, so I wanna uh, explain all three. So the second one is about uh, loss of encoder decoder synchronous the uh, notification. We also discussed this uh, item in last uh, TPAC meeting. We know there is a way RPSI and loss notification. We we got enough information how to implement it. So <clears throat> we think is we can also uh, isolate the actual implementation and requirement. So I want to know whether we can. Uh, add this requirement into the game streaming. Up on Earth. Yeah, I think this one, you know, it, it is an argument about how to do it and it probably deserves discussion in ITF because it, I think the guidance we've seen from both a um, number of implementations is that RPSI currently doesn't really work all that well. But from a API point of view, you know, it, it, as an example, if you wanted to negotiate the LNTF RTCP message, SDP can, can do it. I don't know if Harold or others would say that you need an API to turn it on. Um, but uh, again, I, I'm not sure there's a WebRTC issue here, but there definitely is an implementation issue and a, possibly a, a, an ITF protocol issue. Um, and it is, a lot of people do feel that support for long-term references, this is important. Um, so I don't think you're getting an argument about that. It's just how to how to make it work in, in the web RTC. It's a whole other thing, particularly for it, it is most complicated for conferences. It's actually much simpler for game streaming because that's just typically one to one. But in a conference, getting our, our PSI to work well for you know a thousand participants is is non trivial. Okay. Uh, if there are no more questions, I think we 
we don't have any other uh, uh, feedback, I think we can uh, remove this based on the Bernard feedback. We are okay to uh, drop this requirement. And next one. Yeah, I, I think we should take it up in the ITF because it's an important mm -hmm. problem. But yeah, for WebRTC, we, we may not need it. Okay. Uh, next slide. Yeah, it's similar, uh, might be a similar discussion with before, but uh, this is about uh, consistent latency. We would like to have a configurable our TCP transmission interval, as we uh, described here. We had some discussion also, there is a way to use the uh, like sender side request, the transmission uh, RTCP feedback as uh, a pull request kind of feedback, but we want to have another more general style of uh, configuration to get the uh, RTCP feedback within certain interval. If there's any, uh, I think we need a similar way of SDP uh, handshake for this, Bernard. Uh, yeah, which messages are you particularly interested in? Uh, configuring the transmission interval of? Uh, yeah, we want to know, uh, get the uh, uh, RTCP uh, feedback message. Like, oh, like PLI or something? Or, mm. or just, just a receiver report? Oh. Uh, Srita, uh, he's uh, oh, yeah, okay. so, so transport CC. Okay, that's the major one. Yeah, it's transport CC and NAT. Uh, basically, transport CC is feedback uh, interval and even for NAT, uh, when to trigger controlling those um, APIs are required to better uh, control the uh, or vehicle. So can we uplift this requirement a bit? And I mean, uh, what you want is to, I think from hearing what you're saying, is that what you want is to have a definite time limit by which you will know if packets are lost. And uh, it might be good to just say that instead of, uh, uh, in, instead of specifying which RTCP messages and which controls your looking at. So if you say that you want, you want to know within uh, n milliseconds plus RTT and that packets have been lost or that packets have not arrived, then that's, that's a much more concrete requirement that allows different implementations. I think that, that, uh, that works well for me. Yeah, we can uh, update the statement. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next one, the final one. Uh, so this is about uh, more implementation details. So uh, yes, for the current Jira buffer has a lot of assumption like uh, uh, in the 10, 100 millisecond uh, delay and uh, uh, 60 frames per sec as a, a frame rate. So we want to make sure all the assumption to reflect the actual calculation of the platform. So that is more implementation uh, side requirement. So we started a discussion through uh, WebRTC issue uh, 15535. Uh, that is uh, the current upcoming, uh, the ongoing discussion through the uh, actual bug report. So we we know there is some uh, there is some improvement, but which is not uh, highly requiring any change of APIs. So we believe this is not uh, so clear. 
but we want to hear the feedback from the working group. I'll run that. So, so it, it, uh, how much of this is talking about the uh, API versus talking about the implementation here? Um, mm. Actually, there is no API change required. That's, that's what I thought. This is just a, a commentary on the implementation in LibWebRTC um, needs some improvements in order to support this use case. Yes. So this isn't really an issue for the um, for the working group per se. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the feedback. Okay, I think that's that's it. Uh, oh, anybody? I just wanted to add that there there is an API for Jitter for Target. So if there's any impact on that API, then maybe an issue could be filed that way. But uh, it, I'm not sure it is. So that and that's mostly just to allow you to make to have it delay more. So right. or or less, or less. in theory. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for all the feedback. Uh, we will update the PR based on the discussion. OK, thank you. Um, so now we're going to move uh, to uh, Peter uh, on RTP transfer. Peter, do you want to run your own slides? Or OK, no, I'll, I'll run that for you. and. Uh, so we have 40 minutes, is that right? OK. So today, we will cover reviewing the current state, addressing previous comments, going over specific issues. And then Yanni Var has made some of his own slides. So next slide. First up is reviewing the current state. So to help us all review the current state, I made a document which I call the RTP Transport Reminder. It's a bit like an explainer, except it's there to remind everybody, including myself, where what the current state is. And I'll go over what's in there now, so you don't have to go read it right now. But in the future, take as needed. So for every time we talk about R2 Transport, you can look at it and remember where we're at. Next slide. So the rough consensus so far, this is in the reminder, is that we want some packet level API for sending and receiving RTP and maybe RTCP. That might be a point of discussion a little later. And that packets must always be encrypted using SRTP and SRTCP. And packets must be congestion controlled in as much as RTP and RTCP usually is. Next slide. There is uh, an explainer in the repository. The explainer summary is that we're doing all of this so that a web app can customize things. For example, we just talked about uh, wanting to customize jitter buffer behavior. So using an RTP transport with web codecs might be a great way to do that. Also customizing things like NAC and RTX was just discussed. And customizing, having custom RTCP messages like RPSI or um, LMTF. So we've already discussed today some of the reasons why we want to customize things. But there are others, FEC, metadata, pactization, and uh, different uh, custom codecs. So next slide. Also in the explainer are some examples. And it's really important to know that right now the code examples are what I would call speculative and immature. This is because they are assuming the model I presented at TPAC, which doesn't represent our subsequent discussions, and they probably have mistakes. So some of the uh, assumptions they have are that you would call create RTP transport with that wildcard SDP that I uh, presented at TPAC. And the examples also demonstrate both uh, using what WG streams and not, just to kind of show two possible ways we could go. One on the right side, it uses what WG streams are on the send side. And on the receive side, it uses a normal event handler. So these are not reflective of what we have decided. We don't have agreement on what the API should be at this point. It's just kind of speculative and immature. So getting too hung up on what the examples say right now is a little premature because they're not really representative of what we've decided because we haven't really decided anything 
about what the API should look like yet. Next slide. Okay. So the spec in the repository also is immature. It's just pretty much a skeleton so far uh, with all the like things we should fill in. One, the two things that we were hoping to add uh, shortly were the structs or the dictionaries and interfaces for RTP packets and RTCP packets to describe what should go in those. But perhaps with discussion that we'll have today, uh, th that may change like around how RTCP should work. Next slide. OK, so addressing previous comments, um, some of the comments from last time, you can go to this link and watch the video uh, around time 108. And I listened to that a couple times and tried to pull out the, the kind of summary of the comments. I think the most important ones were that Harold was suggesting there are kind of two modes here. Uh, Ionivar was suggesting uh, maybe an idea of an, an, that this thing could be a new type of data channel. There were lots of suggestions for specific API shape and uh, RTP specifics. And I don't know if it was in that video, but since then there's been this idea of piecemeal customization. I think this one is really important. I don't know where the term piecemeal customization came from, but I think the concept is really important and I wanna talk about that quite a bit in the upcoming slides. So uh, next slide. And this is kind of a summary of where I think we're at, which is we need to figure out what the general direction we want the transport to go in before we figure out what the specifics on the API, the examples, or whether we use what W2 streams or not should be. And I'm gonna present kind of three straw men. These aren't necessarily like very refined proposals. They're just kind of general here, are different directions we could go. So in the middle is kind of where I already presented at TPAC, but two ideas that have come up since then are, like I said, Yanivar had this suggestion that we make a new type of data channel, and I'll kind of describe that. And there's also this idea of piecemeal customization, the idea that you could customize one thing, say the jitter buffer behavior, without customizing everything. And what I presented at TPAC was more like you get a foundational thing and you build up from there. So if you want to customize one thing, you have to customize everything or do everything yourself. So uh, next slide, I'll describe the next three slides. I'll describe these in a little more detail. Okay, so the first straw man, the one on the left, is the idea of a new type of data channel. These are this is my interpretation of or my straw man's uh, interpretation of what Yanni Var suggested. So for example, we could theoretically do something where you call not create RTP transport, but rather some kind of R create, R create RTP data channel on the peer connection. And this would give you an ability to send and receive data over RTP, but you don't necessarily get to control all the specifics of the RTP, like the payload type and the SSRC and the sequence number. Those would be decided by the browser, but you get to pick the payload and maybe the timestamp. And if we had this, a sufficiently sophisticated app that controls both ends could theoretically just put everything in the payload. You could put like custom RTCP messages in the payload. You could put uh, metadata that you would normally think of as header extensions in the payload. And as long as you control both ends, then you know, it doesn't matter where it goes in the packet as long as the data is there. The problem being that it wouldn't be compatible with existing endpoints that you want to have uh, reading header extensions and RTCP messages. But maybe, maybe that's enough. Okay, so the next uh, straw man. On the other end of the spectrum, on, on the right side on the previous slide, uh, so the first one was kind of less complex. This one's like on the other end, which is much more complex. The idea is that you could customize what's coming out of the browser currently or coming out of the existing RTP senders and receivers. So imagine for a minute, that we have some kind of RTP sender dot get RTP stream. And this thing is maybe something like a transferable, or uh, sorry, a transform stream, where you could capture what was going to be sent by the browser, but modify it and insert your own packets instead and control what actually goes out the browser. And then in the reverse direction, what comes in over the network, you get to control what actually gets injected into the browser. So you can get to be sort of a middleman between the network and the, the peer connection as it is. And this would let you customize things piecemeal. So for example, if you wanted to say, okay, I wanna customize packetization, but not RTX, you can take all the packets going by and change the payload inside, but not change the RTX behavior. Or on the, the other direction, you could say, okay, I, I wanna keep the packetization coming out, but I wanna change the RTX behavior. 
And this might be, and probably is, more convenient for an app that wants to customize one thing or the other. However, kind of like this picture I'm showing in the bottom right, um, this would require exposing more of the RTP world and all the pipes and complexities involved with like RTX and everything. So it would lead to a more complex API, but perhaps also a more convenient API. So next slide. The final straw man is really just the one I already presented at TPAC, which is kind of somewhere in between these two. It's kind of like the first one where it has a foundation, uh, kind of depicted in this picture as a slightly more complex one where you control all the RTP parts. And then you build up from there, um, but it doesn't have the piecemeal customization. So it's not as complex as that would need to be. Next slide. Another way of thinking about this is that there are kind of two dimensions that we can uh, decide on, whether an API is more high level or low level, and whether an API allows piecemeal customization uh, or really any customization of what's coming out of the browser, or if it's just kind of an alternate transport where you control what's coming in and out of the network. So if we tried to do a low level API with customization piecemeal, we get that straw man that I presented for full piecemeal customization. If we decided to do a high level API that you can't do that full level customization, you get a new type of data channel. And what I presented previously at TPAC was kind of a low level API that you cannot customize what's coming in and out of existing RTP senders and receivers. And I put a little funny face on the top left bucket because I don't really think that's possible to do that level of customization with a high level API. Another way of thinking about it, next slide, is that we kind of, kind of have a spectrum of simple thing to do, which is a new type of data channel, which is more and more complex type of thing, which is a full piecemeal customization. What I presented at TPAC was kind of somewhere in between. And um, there's uh, pros and cons to being in different places. And we could actually start in one place and move to the right over time. OK, Harold, I'll get you just one more slide here. OK, so as we consider which general direction we want to go, my questions for everybody are kind of, uh, are there other ideas? Did I miss something big? And then, of course, you know which, which one do different people prefer, and how do we decide? So this is where I expect either A, uh, clarifying questions from people, or B, ideas on what people want. So Harold, first in the queue with the question. Yeah, jump, jumping into the queue. Um, I would say that uh, the one dimension you haven't mentioned is that uh, is whether you can talk to existing, existing endpoints. Uh, on the new data channel, you can't. And uh, that kind of uh, makes me wonder what's the advantage of this over over uh, um, using uh, RTP uh, web transport or quick or whatever the flavor of new transports is this week because you can't <laughs> talk to anyone but yourself anyway or anyone but the same trick. On the other hand, the piecemeal thing. I don't think that it actually needs to be complex for the simple case, because in the it, for the parts you don't want to modify, you can simply let them through. Uh, so the advantage of the piecemeal is that as long as you stay within certain parameters, you can talk to people who are not you. And uh, I kind of like that. And so, and in fact, you can talk to people who are otherwise incompatible with you, uh, as long as they implement basic SRTP. So I kind of like the, the piecemeal approach because it uh, provides incremental deployment. And we can actually do in incremental implementation. We just add the API that's needed for the particular function we want to support today. So that's my my end of the queue, end of the spectrum. 
Okay, thank you for your feedback. I will respond to a few questions you had uh, or comments. One is, I think you are correct that the new data channel approach has the difficulty with uh, speaking to existing endpoints. That's what I was trying to say with the backwards compatibility point. Uh, it's like the last, second to last bullet there on this slide. Uh, on the question of quick, uh, at the moment, quick APIs in the browser are not peer to peer. If we ever fix that, then yes, a quick peer to peer uh, transport API would kind of be a, a competitor or, or to RTP transport in a way. Um, and I think you're right about uh, piecemeal having the advantages that you specified. The uh, RTP transport I presented at TPAC does allow you to speak to existing endpoints, but it does not allow for the piecemeal incremental approach. So. All right, who's next? Uh, I think I'm next. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, yes. Thank you for the slides, and I, I agree. We need to make some decisions, um, and I also have some slides at the end, so I'll keep my comments short. Um, and those slides are not proposing a, an RTP data channel. So, uh, I think uh, you and uh, Harald made good points about uh, limitations about that. So, I think the important thing here that we need in order to answer which way to go is uh, a re also a reminder of what problems are we solving and examine the premise that we need to expose RDP to solve it. And I think uh, probably, uh, but I would also uh, suggest that we expose RTP only as needed. Um, and that suggests like a piecemeal approach perhaps. I'm not sure what you mean by piecemeal, if that means incremental based on it, but I also think that we need to talk about what's the scope of where we see these problems. And do we want to make sure that people can, uh, you know, they're happy, people are existing with the people happy with the existing API. Are they able to tweak the small things that they want differently, or do they need to accept a whole different premise, a whole different API? And I think, again, I would hope that we could do piecemeal. And I'll have some slides at the end, so I'll yield my time now. Thanks. Okay, I think Yanni Bar just said he's a second vote for piecemeal. Uh, when you say piecemeal, what do you mean everything, all the pieces on the on the work on the on the floor or and you put it together or do you mean uh bit by bit added to the existing api uh bit by bit added to the existing api but yeah i, I think i want to i want to make it clear that i think that's only possible by being a more low level api not not a high level one but i could be wrong I well, hopefully it... we, we need to go as low as we need to go and no further Okay, I'm just, I, I, my, I've explored some, and I, I could show them, I have it on a subsequent right. slide, about what that API could look like. I, I think it would be slightly lower level and more complex than, uh, than, you, than you might want at first. Yep. All right, Bernard. Bernard? Uh oh, we lost him and the slides. Okay, can you can you hear me now? Yes. Can you do the yeah. slides again? Let me let me do that. Uh, let me share again. Uh, here we go. And okay. All right, so um, one thing I wanted to point out, I think the da Dali did the illustrations for these slides. And it's yes. really smart because on this one, if you'll notice, it's a house in the middle of a lake with no boat. So basically, there's no way to get from this house to the mainland, uh, which I guess you could think of as representing existing WebRTC implementations because it can't really talk to it. Um, and one of the one of the big reasons for doing WebRTC is you kind of want to interoperate with other browsers and all the people who've done WebRTC. So as Harold pointed out, I think that's a pretty huge disadvantage of this approach. Um, and um, I would not uh, favor that. Um, the big question about the piecemeal uh, customization is what Harold said was, are you getting an enormous amount of complexity or not? If you can get the flexibility without the complexity, I think that would be a good thing. But we kind of have to demonstrate um, the principle that Harold was was getting at, which is that you can 
essentially let things just go and and not have to get into them. And and the other thing is, it has the potential appeal of incremental deployability. So you know, if an implementation could add a few things and not have to do everything at once, that makes it easier to implement. And also, if people don't have to do everything, it makes them easier to code. So I think that's kind of just a commercial advantage that's actually pretty important, is not forcing a lot on the implementers and not forcing a lot on the app developers all at once. So it's I think of it as kind of a practical thing where, where it actually increases the appeal without necessarily uh, you know, messing up the deployment or the, or the use of it. Um, but we have to demonstrate that, that you can get that without an insane amount of complexity. Okay, so it sounds like another vote for piecemeal. Years with saying keep the complexity low, similar to Yandivar, keep the not too low level, I think it was. All right, you in. Yep, probably another vote for uh, piecemeal as well. Uh, the, the way I see it is that um, a website should be able to override some parts of the pipeline, but at the end of the day, we almost always want uh, a user agent to take over. So I, I see like you customize in JavaScript because this behavior is not great. And then the user agent at some point will be able to catch up. And you, you the nice improvement that you made in JavaScript, it will be deployed to all websites. And, and that way, um, it's not only a few websites that will benefit because we have a, a large uh, developer community, but uh, hopefully, uh, more websites um, and small websites. So that's why I, I really like the, the piecemeal approach. Uh, complexity is important. I think that we started to expose uh, points in the pipeline. Uh, WebRTC and Code Transform is one example. And uh, we should try to continue doing that uh, progressively. And um, one way of trying to that, that might help is to see how uh, these existing uh, injection points relate to the new injection point that we would add. Uh, like we are doing the exercise for codex, like how you plug codex with the thread. It's, it's still in the, in the early days, but it's still uh, useful. And uh, WebRTC and Code Transform is also uh, connecting to, to the packet packetizers and depacketizers. So how does it relate uh, and so on? That, that that might be helpful as well to to figure out how we um, add this support there. OK, thank you. Anyone else? Henrik, I, I'm looking at you. Your video's on. You haven't said anything. <laughs> I think uh, another benefit of piecemeal is that just the, the practicality of shipping features is it's good if you can say, here's a piece, let's implement that, let's ship it. Um, but I'm, I'm not an expert on the RTP level of things, so I don't have uh, much to add to the discussion. All right. Well. Let's move on with the slides then. This has been very good feedback. Thank you, everyone. Um, the next slides are on the issues. And I I made all of these slides as like an if, <laughs> if this direction, if that direction. So uh, there's an issue about customizing piecemeal. And obviously, if we took the other two directions, it's not possible. With the piecemeal customization, obviously, it is. So this one can be resolved if we had this direction. Um, I put on here some rough idea of how I think this could be done, which I can flesh out in future presentations. Uh, but basically, I think it could be done by taking the RFC 7656 uh, that describes the RTP taxonomy and then exposing objects that relate to those. The most important one being an RTP stream, which uh, has one SSRC at a time. and then it has a bunch of packets. And then you build on top of that and repaired stream by adding RTX. And then you kind of can build up from there. Um, I'll flush this out more in, in the future, but um, I, I'll do some design work to try and 
balance this piecemeal approach with keeping the complexity low and uh, come back with something a little more structured. I just wanted to point out that I have some ideas already in this direction. Uh, Bernard? Yeah, so is it correct to say that the one of the focuses of these objects is kind of the custom FEC, custom RTX kind of a uh, scenario? Or Yeah, the, the idea here is that uh, you can customize a particular thing if you want, but you can leave the other things untouched. So if you wanted to change an RTP stream, but leave RTX enabled, you could. But if you wanted to customize the RTX, you could. And if you wanted to step in before any of that happened and customize back, you could. Um, I have written in paper here, like a whole bunch of ideas of like, OK, in this case, if you want to customize metadata, you do this. If you want to customize uh, Jitterbuff, you do this, and so on. So. I kind of explored this idea to make sure that I felt it was a viable option, and I, I do think it is, before I made the straw man. Um, but I didn't want to go and type up a whole bunch of slides with things if nobody actually wanted to go that direction. But now that I have the feedback that you know people want to go this piecemeal direction, I can go do uh, fleshing that out more. Uh, Yanni Bar. Sorry, I think Stefan is first. Yeah. Oh, over. fun. Sorry. Um, would you, in this case, write or somehow uh, uh, insert packets into these RTP screens objects? Or what was it thinking? Yes, I think uh, we need to be able to both capture what would have been sent and or allow it through, as mentioned, right? Uh, just letting the packet flow through if you're not customizing is is important. But if you want to customize it, you need to both be able to get what would have been sent and modify it and then inject back. And the inject back is really critical. This isn't just a like modify it while it's flowing through. It needs to be something yeah. where you can capture it and then sit on it or drop it or whatever and then go and inject something completely different. And there are a lot of implications for that around like congestion control and bitrate allocation and so forth. And mm -hmm. um that's why I've said that you know, this gets a little complex, but I do think it's feasible, and I've thought through a lot of these things already. Okay. Um, okay, Yanni Bart dropped out of the queue. Harold? Just a concurring comment that uh, that uh, once you once you are allowed to insert frames, uh, insert packets, uh, then you're don't need to generate any packets. You can just, uh, you, you don't need to have a platform to generate any, any packets for you. You can just generate them yourself. Yes, so and, uh, you can you can think of- And actually, because then there are both directions, both upstream and downstream, as needed. In yes. the, it, at the frame level discussions, we have had uh, uh, discussions about uh, allowing insertion and moving stuff between and uh, uh, and uh, gen generating packets, I think we should go in for being able to generate packets from the beginning in both directions. Yes, absolutely. Um, you can think of this as kind of a superset of what I presented at TPAC. Because at, at TPAC, you could inject things into the network and then receive things from the network. And here, it's that you can also inject into the RTP senders and receivers or get what comes out. You're not constrained, like you said, on what you can send to the network or send into the uh, existing RTP receiver by having something already being pushed. You can just drive it yourself. All right. Oh, wait. We got more people in the queue. So the slide movement was a little premature. Yanni Var. Oh, yeah. So, sorry. So, yeah, I dropped off the queue. I'm not sure what that happened. But... <laughs> Uh, so here you say full piecemeal customization, and that makes me a little worried because it it's kind of set up as uh, the highest level API would be the RTP data channels, and the lowest level API, but these are the extremes. And it sounded like most people wanted something in the middle. Uh, mm -hmm. And here again, uh, it seems premature to me to basically let's dig into RFC and take everything about RTP and expose it. So that's my feedback. But I also have slides sure, at the I, end that I'm hoping uh, I'll have time I'm, to present. 
So uh, right. I'll, I'll save it. So there. what I meant by this slide was not, OK, we're all agreeing to what Peter stuck here as a very rudimentary design proposal. What I'm saying is that um, we could, we can do something. Something is feasible. We, right. Like this is this is possible. We're not agreeing on what the API shape is now. Right. We're just agreeing on the general direction that we want to go piecemeal customization. Yes. I just want to avoid false choices before we get dig into the API surfaces. I think that's Yes, I wanted to make sure we're all on, on, on the same page in the general direction, which it sounds like we are, which is great, before jumping in. And that's why I was saying like I will come back with more uh specific Good. API proposals, but other people Thanks. can make them as well. Uh Henrik. So this slide, I think, uh, gives me similar vibes to Encode and Transform, where you, you expose a thing. Uh, the app is interested in one part, uh, and then it picks up the, you know, the parts that it's interested in, and it can either modify or it can inject. Um, it, it feels very similar to something that we've uh, already started doing, and I think has shown that it is both powerful and allows you to to iterate and I see you the piecemeal. Uh, so I'm basically just saying that I, I think this this gives me good vibes. It's obviously too little details to 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 know what this means, but uh, so far I, I, I like it. Good vibes, I like it. I think we need to cue a Beach Boys song now. All right. Uh, so then. Issue 10 is about the SDP bumper lanes. And uh, basically, I think if we go down the piecemeal customization route, we're going to end up with what I call lightly enforced bumper lanes, where you will be fixed in some things, like the header extension IDs or the payload types that are negotiated, but you'll be able to customize the actual payload and the actual values in the header extensions. So. Um, now that we know roughly the direction we want to go, we can uh, get into more detail about that. But any comments or thoughts on the the bumper lanes and the idea of them being lightly enforced or any other thoughts, Bernard? Yeah, just um, at the last meeting, I guess Harold had a concern about uh, interaction of existing SDP and peer connection with the uh, RTP transport. And so the enforcement bumper lanes was important to make sure they didn't conflict. Kind of, you know, it's stay on your side of the road, dude. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I think I think this is good because it's part of the piecemeal in that you 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 can do a lot of existing stuff and just use pure connection if you want to do that. But um, you can just do the customization on the pieces of it that you want and not interfere with the other stuff. Yeah, so the, the thing that will get a little more interesting here is um, if we add the ability to create RTP streams that are not part of any existing RTP sender or receiver. So if you had like, you know, create RTP stream and you wanted to send packets there, then you would need to decide what the bumper lanes on that are. Um, yeah, for see, example, it might it might have a strong bumper lane on SSRC to make sure you don't conflict with the existing SSRCs, but it might have a weak bumper lane on payload type. Yeah, so that's where some of the things come up, like what Harold said, where, you know, say I want to do my own audio codec, it, you, you do have to have allocation of the payload type or it could, it could get allocated for some other thing, right? I'll let Harold talk about it. Harold. Yes, so uh, my my thought is that you probably should have a an uh, API for reserving things. Yeah, yeah, like SSRCs are nice. If you just have an API that says, "Hey, I want an SSRC," then you have it, and you can use it freely. Uh, and in some cases, it might make sense for the API, not the implementation. The API to refer to things by name instead of by number. For instance, uh, head extensions are named by URI, but uh, the numbers are actually negotiated. So, uh, if you have you if you refer to them by URI when you write them, then 
you just can't collide or you're overwriting the, the ones that are pre-existing. If you refer to them by number, you can get much, get much more confused. So careful design of the API should make it relatively easy to make bumper lanes work for you. Yeah, I think you're exactly right about the SSRC and having a mechanism to allocate them so that now you know they're not conflicting with existing ones. Um, that's an interesting idea about the URIs versus IDs. I'll have to, I'll have to think about that one some more. I have the same same problem in, uh, up in uh, frame level land where we currently have a proposal to refer to to media types by MIME type instead of by payload type because uh, that uh, makes some things a lot easier. All right, any other thoughts on bumper lanes before we move on? Okay, I guess we've moved on to Cryptex. So um, we'll just skip to the second point there, uh, which I think we could say we just use what's negotiated in the SDP. Um, but maybe other people have other opinions because for the other things, I thought maybe we'd have an API point to turn it on and off. Um, so let's discuss that. But I, I do want to point that whether or not we have an API point for it, or if it's just negotiated in SDP, it should be applied at the SRTP layer in the implementation such that the web app never sees the encrypted packet, just like DTLS and SCTP or Quick. And it just is something that happens underneath. So there were there was some discussion about like transform streams and encrypted packets visible to uh, the the web app. And I don't think we should go down that road. It should just be something that happens underneath. And we're just really questioning whether there should be an API point, to turn it on or off. And if we're going down the piecemeal customization, I think we should just use what's negotiated in the SDP. Thoughts? Bernard. Yeah, I think I think using what's negotiated in the SDP should be fine. I mean, basically we have a Cryptex API and we're about to see extensions. Um, and uh, you know, if it, if the other side can do Cryptex, it, it it is possible in the RFC to turn it on for on a per packet basis, but I don't really understand why you would do that if the other side can can support Cryptex. It's like why why not just encrypt everything? Um, so I, I don't see the need to for the per packet control personally. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, let's move on then. Workers. So um, we skip down to the second bullet point, assuming we're not going to go with the other two straw men. Um, we basically need something that can be transferred. And I think that uh, as we come up with API points, like I was suggesting earlier, an RTP stream object, but it doesn't have to be that. It could be something else. We just need to make sure that the thing that we create is transferable. And I think that's doable. And basically, as we design the API, make sure it works with workers. Any thoughts on this? Harold? Yeah, look, sounds good to me. And just to re remember that when you transfer, you're, you're actually transferring like one end of a tube. And uh, what's... Uh, at the other end of the tube stays attached to where it was originally. And uh, that, may, that may have implications for how it's possible to implement this. Like I have always these questions about does transfer work between different processes, different workers? I mean, and can you send the transfer a data channel to something in a, something that's outside of your of your own own uh, scope or do you need to be in a single worker cluster so that's the kind of thing you have to think about with when you say transfer okay 
Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Bernard. Yeah, so a couple of things to point out. One is, you know, we support transferable streams, but I don't know that the RTP stream you're talking about here is necessarily a WD stream. So I'm wondering whether, in fact, that is you trying to use transferable streams. The other thing is, when we were looking at the use cases, we found that transferring individual objects may not be the right thing. Because as an example, if you want to do custom NAC, what you're trying to do is both receive both receive the RTP packet so you can figure out what you're getting, but also send a NAC, right? So it's it's a you have both a receiving RTP stream and a sending NAC, a sending RTCP stream. So it's like you, you may need combinations of of read streams and write streams to do anything. Um, and for that reason, sometimes it, you know, and because also it, I'm not, if we don't, I haven't decided on what WD streams, I don't know that the transferable stream here thing will actually work. That's where transferring objects may make more sense. So you kind of get everything you need to do a particular um, use case. Yeah, I, 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 I agree that, that, I agree that as we go about this, we should, try to figure out specific things people would want to do with workers and make sure that they're convenient. So if they have to transfer like seven different small objects over, is that a pain? And then RTCP, to your point, is especially tricky since the DMUX of RTCP is far more a mess right. than the DMUX of RTP. Yeah, also, uh, Stefan Homer had mentioned at one point, thinking carefully about what work what workers you needed to support. So, for example, transferring things to audio worklets as well as to workers. So, I think we may need to hone in on exactly what the worker requirement is. Good feedback. Thank you. Yanivar. Oh, so, yes, uh, I think we're over time. And uh, I feel like uh, I have uh, four slides to go through. So, and uh, I, I can barely. Uh, uh, so I'm wondering uh, if we could, I think my slides answer some of these questions like workers and. Uh, okay, let me, uh, let me, let me okay. buzz past the remaining slides I have then. I just want to point out, we should discuss at some point the question of arbitrary RT, RTCP and arbitrary RTP headers, because with RTP headers, they are not necessarily encrypted. They are with Cryptex um, and with RTCP, you know, do we want to allow our trade? I think we should, but we should discuss it. Um, and then one more slide. I, I did want to point out my opinion of the question of what WD streams, can you go up one? Is that it's down the list of things we need to worry about. Like first we should get a general sense of the direction we want to go, which is piecemeal. It's great, we have some agreement on that. And next, like the general shape of the API and the kinds of objects we want, and then what, we can do things with what WG streams are not, depending on like, you know, its merits or demerits or how much pain we think it is to use them. Um, but I actually think that it's kind of this issue eight is kind of down the priority list, and we should worry about the bigger picture things first. So, Yanivar, your turn. Uh, yes. So uh, thanks. And so I added some slides to the deck here that I hope can answer some questions. So what WG streams? Uh, the existing explainer in RTP transport uses them. I think that's good. Uh, web transport and web socket, uh, web transport, but also web socket and web RTC went one way and web transport went the other way. So we have two different data input APIs. So I think we should try to use one of those before we invent a third. Uh, there's a question of RTP could have back pressure on the send side, but do you really want it? I would say yes, for the same reason that web transport datagrams have it. <clears throat> um, back pressure or sender side, even if there's not uh, any transport back pressure uh, allows apps to hook up pull based sources and it lets the browser keep its off process send buffer filled for throughput. And also, our existing transform APIs already use it. So, those are the arguments I think for considering what WG streams in the mix. Um, but we can always talk about the, uh, another question is what type is the chunk that is in the stream? And that might be another vector for, for adding APIs that we might consider. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so um, first I want to point out some, um, I think ex the explainer examples were very helpful in getting the scope of what problems we wanted to solve. 
but there's some problems with them right now, which is that they use non-standard APIs. Uh, <clears throat> that's problem one. And the other one is that they pipe mul multiple streams into a writable, which it will actually give you an error. Um, and it also fails to uh, address a worker-first feedback from Jessup and myself uh, in earlier meetings, as well as uh, uh, fails to address issue 13, which is about workers. Bernard? Yeah, and there's yet another problem because it calls PC.create encoded streams, which doesn't even exist in the proprietary API. So it actually should be sender.create encoded streams. Yes. Even Good more point. easy. Yes. So uh, next slide. And uh, we can see uh, if we update this to the, the spec, uh, this solves a lot of these problems. It solves workers. And it also lets us move the RTP transport off main thread. Um, with the understanding from the examples that it is basically a packetizer sync. It's a sync that allows you some packetizing. And that was the part of the explainer I really liked because it was very concrete and it, it tells about scope. Earlier we talked about RTP transport, but I think people also, I think Peter, you also mentioned RTP stream, which I think is a more limited uh, transport makes this thing of, it's an object that represents, you know, all kinds of, does it go across streams? Does it, is it for the entire transport? But here it's not, it's very clear sync that allows us to do some very cool things like we can trans have a transform function at the bottom and we can uh, basically take frames and we can packetize those frames that gives the application more control uh, which was and solving some of the limitations we had in the transform api where you had to be very careful not to step on particular codecs like h.264 when you were transforming uh, data so um but, but also notice here that uh, this removes the need to transfer anything because uh, here we actually create an RTP transport uh, in order to get a new writable in the transformer itself, which is interesting because the on RTP RTC transform event fires with a readable and a writable. Mm -hmm. And here we're piping from the readable, but we're not using the writable. We're creating an RTP. Uh, we're basically switching out the writable with, uh, from one that took an encoded frame to one that takes packets. And the genius of the for loop here is that you can actually, a single frame can result in multiple packets. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so, but conceptually all we've done here, is actually switched the output type from encoded frame to packet. And there's a similarity here to Harald's um, uh, JS codec cases with Lyra uh, use case requirements where he wanted to switch the, as I understood it, the input uh, from an encoded frame to an unencoded frame. So what if we let JavaScript change the expected input and output types? And I'm just showing the sender side here. This is all sender side. We can imagine receiver. Uh, so then the default would be encoded frame to encoded frame. Use case would be end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, maybe you could switch it from encoded frame to packet to add metadata, which was shown in the previous slide. Uh, the other alternatives would be unencoded frame to encoded frame, for instance, the JavaScript encoder, or if you want to control the full pipeline from frame to packet. And I think what it does is actually closes the gap between, we've discussed whether we want a frame API versus a packet API, and it also preserves a worker-first API, which we have in transforms. So why transforms? We built a pipeline into the browser, and the idea that it would be accessible was not really a central idea when we built it, right? This lets the entire, so this new thinking here lets the entire pipeline be accessible at different points off the main thread. Uh, next slide. And two cases I left out, which are important ones, uh, is, well, what if all the transforms are transforming something, so it's, you still have a sender track, but there are also people that wanna use web codecs directly. And this is perhaps where the transform model fits the least, but I still think it can fit. And there have been, um, this will basically mean you ignore the readable, but you write to the writable. And I think that people have experimented with that already. Um, and, and why? Well, because pr probably people will ask to use web codecs with this thing, uh, similar to using it with web transport. Does it break uh, with the transfer model? Uh, yes, a little bit. But short of transferring the RTCP connection, any API is going to, Feel like a retrofit and the benefit of the transfer model is it's worker first so 
while we you know we could either overload the transform directly or we could create maybe a new um, encoder or source we could have a sender source attribute where you get a, a different callback on our on rtxe encode where it's that you only get a writable and not a readable and similarly on the receiver side so these are my thoughts of uh, how we could approach this hopefully in a way that bridges multiple use cases together and preserves some important principles with that i think we don't have any time to discuss but um we're at the hour so any any brief thoughts of course i have a thought i mean transform has proved to be a very limiting model so it's okay that uh, so it's perfectly okay with me to say that uh, a transform is just a, sep a special case of a sending api and the receiving api coupled together the sending api and the receiving api could be done in multiple ways including uh, including worker first and uh, and and be and we, we we should try to reduce the coupling between the components not 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 uh, preserved one of the problems with encoder frames is that it uh, has a lot of coupling between the source and the, and the sink that are that is invisible to the applications and that's really painful so let's not do that mistake again all right i think uh, thanks for your feedback i think we are at time i don't see anyone else on the queue sorry we ran out of time on this one Yeah, just um, something to note, which is that um, obviously more work will be needed on this API. And we've talked about having uh, a design team to try to come up with, you know, next steps on this. Um, so probably there's not a lot of time between now and the holidays to do that. But um, in the new year, maybe worth um, people just trying to come work on more proposals. So we're we can advance more quickly in the meetings rather than trying to, um, yeah, so we're better prepared. Um, and also can get the explainer and the spec beyond its current somewhat uh, skeletal state. Anyway, thank you everybody. We have a meeting next week. So we will be back on the air uh, at, at the same time. Thanks everyone. See you all in a week with a completely new agenda. <laughs>